another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley, the founder of ChristianGospelChurch.org. Together, we're examining the history and the intersections in history between William Branham and other key figures that either influenced or were influenced by the post-World War II healing revivals. Charles, I'm just going to pause for a moment and say that the last episode was one of the most exciting and interesting shows that we've had. And uh, although this may not be quite as interesting, it is by far one of the most fascinating subjects that we've had. And I've had throughout the years, several people contact us and, you know, try to learn more about the topic that we're about to discuss and its relationship to white supremacy, because many times the two just kind of get blended together. And I'm fascinated with studying this just simply because I am fascinated with archaeology and history and You know, all of these topics that we're about to discuss is like bundled up into one pseudoscience, if you will. And I'm just I I think our listeners are going to enjoy this one quite a bit. Yeah. So today we're going to start talking about the roots of Christian identity theology and the serpent seed doctrine. And um, this is something we've really needed to do for, for a long time. Honestly, we've kind of been working our way here, but. Serpent Seed, it really plays a very, very important role in the ministry of William Branham, the Serpent Seed Doctrine. And I honestly, I think it's fair to say that Serpent Seed is the teaching that really took William Branham's ministry beyond the point of no return with mainstream Christianity and Pentecostalism. And I I think it's fairly common knowledge that the Serpent Seed was the final nail in in the coffin of William Branham's ministry. Um, I, I think that's in, within the message, I think everybody knows that. Like everyone kind of acknowledges Serpent Seed was kind of the point at which um, he was in free fall with the mainstream and never could come back. But yeah, the reason we thought that mainstream Christianity rejected British is- or br- rejected Serpent Seed is a little different than really the true reason that they did, right? I mean, obviously in the message, we think we know everything there is about serpent seed, but there there's secret parts of serpent seed that only some people know. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to start talking about today. I know that, you know, for the people who were in the message or any of its direct splinter groups, not the ones that are distant splinter groups, but William Branham, you know, he came out as as claiming that he introduced this to the world, and it was one of the, quote, divine mysteries of God. And he convinced every one of his listeners who did not know the history that he's the one who introduced it to the world. Those who knew, you know, took a step back and said, wait a minute, you can't claim that you own this. And so they kind of left the movement. So what you're left with is literally a bunch of people who don't understand the history. And the the reason why everyone left is so, you know, it, it's just, it's mind boggling, to be honest. The the racism in the United States at the time they were leaving William Branham was becoming very militant. I mean, we're talking the United States Army was getting involved. It was that bad. So people were starting to say, to wake up and say, no, we're not going to be any part of this. This is a very destructive movement. And William Branham literally convinced every one of his main followers and the splinter groups that emerged from that main trunk that the reason everyone abandoned was because they abandoned him as the messenger, not because of this this terrible thing that's going on in the background. Right. And, you know, one thing that the information control and thought control of the message has done a very good job has been enforcing these ideas that William Branham came up with all of these doctrines and in so doing it, no one ever even don't even occur to anybody to go look to go look and see if it's true or not it's not I mean not, there's not a single thing William Branham preached that that was not <laughs> copied from someone else not a single thing and the thing is the true history of serpent seed is one of the most masterful cover-ups of the message you know in if you go to history books 
and you look up the history of serpent seed and try to find out this stuff, you will discover serpent seed is alive and well outside of the message today. And we sprung from the same root. Serpent seed is a key doctrine of the Ku Klux Klan to this day. And it is a key doctrine of the neo-Nazi movement and white supremacy in general. And it always has been since the inception of the teaching of serpent seed. That is where it comes from. And <clears throat> British Israel, Christian identity, uh, the British Israel theology and Christian identity, they have a version of serpent seed. It, like I said, it's been racial from its very inception. It was always racial. And William Branham even taught it in the exact same racial ways in his sermons um, when, when he preached serpent seed himself, he preached it exactly the same. And we'll get into that, not necessarily in this episode, but into the next one. This stuff's all on tape, right? Like you don't even have to, um, you, you, we don't have to make this stuff up. It's all on tape. We can play the tapes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. What's funny is those who defend William Branham and claim that he's not racist, because William Branham has this huge following, even still today, in parts of Africa with you know the black communities, and and they will vehemently deny that William Branham was racist because William Branham made statements that were all inclusive while speaking on the other side of his tongue. There's, I don't know if you've watched the old Westerns, but there's always this old Indian that says, white man speak with forked tongue. And <laughs> William Branham literally is doing this because even with his serpent seed, he introduces it as though it's not racist and says, I love all my, he calls them colored brethren. I love all my colored brethren. But then he introduces the high breeding to go with it, which is all of the racist stuff. And so on one side of his tongue, he's saying that he's for equality. And on the other side, he literally is he's preaching the very discrimination that everyone else is being blamed for uh, during this type during this time during the United States history of civil rights so I, I'm just fascinated to get into this and understand the roots of it because as we've been doing all along if you want to know why the tree is bearing bad fruit you go back to look at the tree itself what kind of tree is this Yeah, it, it, it's something else yeah, and, and you talk about, you know, some people deny it, but then you got Calco Philippe, like we talked about in our last episode, John, <laughs> who has literally implemented this Christian identity, serpent seed ideas, among th a vast number of followers in Africa, right? Yeah. And then they'll say, no, this isn't racist. John, I, before this is over with, I'm going to tell you how, how I was indoctrinated personally in this, and it involved Africa black people, John, teaching me that they was the serpent seed where I come from. And I'll, I'll share all that. Uh, if not in this episode, certainly in the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it blows your mind. It blows your mind that even people of color in the message believe this stuff about themselves. It, it's, it's really sad. But, you know, before we get into the explosion that serpent seed caused in William Brown's ministry and, and what all that was, I, I think we got to talk a little bit about the British Israel movement, right? right. And that's really going to be the main thrust of our episode today is, is kind of setting up what happened in the British Israel movement to produce all of this. Because the British Israel movement is really where serpent seed was born. I know I've talked about British Israelism a lot, and it is because a lot of the preachers around William Branham were British Israel. British Israelism is where a whole lot of the message's ideology was born. Um, British Israelism is more than just an idea that they were the ten lost tribes of Israel. This was It was a full-blown theology that had all kinds of components, and Serpent Seed was one of the components that developed within British Israelism. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that here as we go. But um, <clears throat> Uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, everyone is really interested in this topic as I am. So, <laughs> <laughs> so diving in, uh, British Israelism is something sometimes called Anglo-Israelism. Kind of, you know, two terms for the same thing, British Israelism or Anglo-Israelism. And those two terms is really referring to the same movement. And I'll also mention there are very few, John, there are very few good scholarly resources um, on British Israelism as a whole. Um, you, you can find tons of primary sources out there, but very little in terms of, of critical history um, of the movement. Um, and on one hand, I do find it really surprising that there's so few good scholarly sources on this, 
so, because it really was a very huge movement in the 1800s. There were certainly millions of people who embraced British Israelism uh, during its peak years. And the ideology was influential in almost every significant Christian denomination of the English-speaking world um, during its peak years. Um, and British Israelism was especially popular among the holiness churches from which Pentecostalism would emerge, and also churches of Adventist theology. And it also had a pretty large following in the older mainstream denominations, too. British Israelism it just had this huge following. So, on one hand, it surprises me a little bit that there's not a whole lot of research into it. But that said, we do have access to hundreds of primary sources, uh, we know all about exactly what they believed. It's all wrote down and, and well documented. And I will point our listeners just to a couple books if they do want to uh, have a starting point on this stuff. Here's one book I'll, I'll recommend, and I'll show the, hold these up again maybe at the end, but Race Over Grace by Charles Roberts. This gives a pretty good, solid early history of British Israelism in this book and traces it into the Christian identity movement. You'll find a lot about Serpent Seed in there. But here's this, the second book is the one I'd really recommend highly the most. And John, I know this one's referenced a lot in our research. Um, this is called um, Religion and the Racist Right by Michael Barcoon. And this book is probably the best book on this topic I know. The first couple chapters are a deep dive into the history of British Israelism, and he then walks you through the emergence of Christian identity theology. Um, and there's a whole section in this book, uh, quite a few pages on William Branham personally in this book, and his contributions to um, serp the development of serpent seed theology. Um, that, so there's some real, actually some shocking stuff in there, and, and it's an interesting book. I, I certainly recommend it for a read, anyone that wants to look into that stuff. Right. And before we get too deep into it, <clears throat> I think I'll preface for those who are researchers who are interested in what we're talking about. Um, like the William Branham movement, to understand its full extent, you have to look beyond the religion. Because William Branham and the message movement, it was not a religious cult. It was a political cult disguised as a religious cult. And we see that with the Klan and all the various things that are going on in the background. Well, the British Israelism was also introduced as a, you know, as a science combined with theology. So it was, it was this merging of doctrine and pseudo history. It wasn't actual history. And what's interesting is King James I of England was a strong supporter of the British Israelism doctrine, and he's the one, he's the reason why we have the King James Bible. So as this guy who is, you know, trying to expand his empire, doing it through religion, and he's also trying to claim that he is part of the, you know, the lost tribes of Israel. So there was a very strong political component and there's a very strong historical component, and it's much, much larger than we can fully cover in this episode, but we can skim the surface and you know exactly where to look and what to look for. Definitely, definitely. So what, one other kind of interesting thing about Michael Barcoon's book I might mention is that he, this is wrote in the 1990s, John. So this is before any of the research that you have unearthed, uh, you know, anything that's come out since the 90s. Yet he sees a connection between William Branham and the white supremacists. Wow. And in his book, he cannot quite connect the dots, right? He sees that William Branham has the same ideology, and it's developing in the same line as Christian identity theology. But he's, like, it's, he's over here to the side, and he's trying to figure out, how do I fit William Branham in? Because he, he, at his time, didn't realize that William Branham was ordained by the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he's trying to figure out, how do I make William Branham fit in here yeah. with all of this? Um, but we know more than Michael Barcone knew when he wrote that book, and we are able today to actually connect the dots um, fully. Um, and put William Branham in his rightful place in, in all of the development of that ideology. Honestly, I think the reason why historians, you know, like the one you mentioned, are missing this is because when they want to understand William Branham's uh, Christian identity doctrine, his serpent seed doctrine, they go to his sermon on the serpent seed, and Branham has 
purposefully removed all of the racist elements from that so that any researcher who goes and looks at the serpent seed, they're going to see this thing that they think is not racist because they don't know to combine his other doctrines, such as the high breeding doctrine with it. So he's kind of, William Bram's kind of slipped under the radar, if you will. And um, like I said, King James um, used it as a political tool. The Klan was using it as a political tool. But all of that, you know, the King James history of using this doctrine, it wasn't really yet a movement. So it might be good, Charles, if we just talk about how the uh, Anglo-Israel doctrine developed into a movement. Sure. So you, you had odds and ends people who believed British Israelism from, I believe, the earliest documented people or in the 1500s, actually, um, that I'm aware of. Um, there was uh, there, There's some odds and ends writing, some odds and ends people that believe it. But it's never a mainstream, popular ideology. It's kind of a, it's a fringe idea until you come up into the early 1800s. And there's a man in the early 1800s, his name is John Wilson. And he began to write extensively on the subject of British Israelism. And he began to travel and lecture, speaking on the topic. And as I said, John Wilson, he certainly wasn't the first person to believe in British Israelism, but he is the one who really starts the movement that takes British Israelism mainstream. Now, as he does this, the way he does this is he, what he does is he makes a study of the English language, John Wilson does. And he basically arrives at the conclusion that the English language has evolved from Hebrew, right? And so this is his, that forms really the basis and the main thrust of his arguments that the English-speaking peoples are descendants of the Ten Lost Tribes because he believes that English is evolved from Hebrew. He, he wrote a, here's one of his books on the topic. And he, he traveled and he wrote on that topic quite extensively. And as he did that, traveling all over the United Kingdom to hundreds of events to speak on this thing, um, he ends up uh, getting the attention and meeting a man named Charles Smythe. Here's a picture of Charles Smythe. And Charles Smythe loves the British Israel ideas when he hears them. And he starts touring with John Wilson, and they start holding um, joint lectures together and really supporting each other very strongly. And... Um, you know, as I was looking at this earlier, John, I, I realized we're not the first John and Charles to speak about British <laughs> Israelism. <laughs> History repeats itself. <laughs> right. So actually, the, the British Israel movement was launched by a, a John and Charles duo. <laughs> wow. You now here is a John and Charles duo, uh, you know, killing it. <laughs> we're talking bad about it. So it's went full circle, right? So what you're saying is that they're the Joker and Penguin to our Batman and Robin. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so so Charles Smythe was an archaeologist, and he had already spent a whole lot of time in Egypt before he met John Wilson and learned of British Israelism. And in Egypt, Smith, in a lot of ways, becomes the father of pyramidology. Very interesting, John. Smythe wow. here is, the fa is really the, one of the fathers of pyramidology who's traveling with John Wilson, spreading British Israelism, okay? And to the researchers who haven't already picked up on this, William Branham taught that the Zodiac was the first Bible, and the Great Pyramid of Giza was the second Bible. So Charles Smythe is arguably the man who invented those ideas, John. Right. And he believed the pyramids were made before Noah's flood by Enoch and Noah, and that through studying their... Geometry, you could reveal secret hidden mysteries in the pyramids, right? And so that's who that's who Charles Smythe is. He teams up with John Wilson, and the two of them start touring together and sharing their ideas together. They're basically jointly touring, lecturing. Um, and so British Israelism and pyramidology at the beginning of this movement were being popularized together at the same time by the same circle of people. And the two beliefs were very, very interconnected and, and influenced each other quite a bit. And throughout the early history of the 1800s, the people who believed in pyramidology and British Israelites were largely the same people. And they were burying in pyramid graves, John. This is, <laughs> this is Charles Smythe's grave. 
Wow. Which is, again, to the best of my knowledge, this is the origin of the pyramid graves among the pyramidologists, okay? And, you know, just how many people do we know that are buried under pyramid graves? Quite a few, sadly. <laughs> yeah. I'll throw some up on the screen, but we we have Charles Taze Russell, the leader of the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who William Branham, you know, copied a lot of his doctrines from. And William Branham has the pyramid. You can see a few different ones I'll throw on the screen. And Charles Taze Russell actually was influenced by British Israelism and pyramidology. He accepted and taught a fair bit of uh, the ideas that they developed. Um, he didn't teach the core British Israel idea, but he did develop and rather teach, you know, other aspects of it, like the pyramidology that came along with it. So, so there's that. Now, pyramidology and British Israelism, they were, they were really a package deal in the very beginning. And whenever you find a pyramidology in, in especially the early 1800s, you can safely assume they were influenced by British Israelism and vice versa. Whenever you find the British Israelites, you can assume they have been influenced by pyramidology because they, they are a package deal. Most all of their literature merges those things, in, in, you know, a whole lot. So, right. Keep in mind here, British Israelism is is not a denomination, right? It's not a independent religious movement, but it it's a movement that's operating within existing groups. It's interdenominational. Sound familiar? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a political movement, not really yes. a religious movement. Exactly, and and so it's able to 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 go between churches very easily and so it it's it has a loose um federation together a loose group that's supporting the ideas but it's not tied to any particular denomination and its adherents are all over the place in all kinds of groups um and even outside of you know mainstream christianity in some places and now as british israelism makes its way into the united states it starts to pick up a new flavor and it develops some um, distinctions from British Israelism in the United Kingdom. There's a man named Edward Hine. I don't have a picture of him here, but we could find one probably. He, he took over as a leader of the movement in the UK after John Wilson died. And it's under Hine that British Israelism really finally spreads into the United States. And um, during the 1870s, a minister named Joseph Wilson rather Joseph Williams, sorry, he traveled from the United Kingdom to Boston and he began spreading British Israel ideas in the United States from Boston. And in Boston, he meets a man named um, Cal Totten, see, Charles Totten. I have a picture of him here, Charles Totten. And Charles Totten falls in love with British Israel ideas and he really becomes the head leader of the British Israel movement in the United States in you know the 1870s. He is a professor at Yale University. He's a veteran of the Civil War. Um, and he lends a whole lot of weight to British Israelism in the United States. He writes on it, travels, and talks on British Israelism in the United States quite extensively. And a whole lot of the popularization of British Israelism in the United States can be linked to Cal Totten and, and what he did in Yale, at Yale University, honestly. So as he did that through the later 1800s, um, that is when British Israelism starts to take a very strong racial turn. It's As it's come to the United States, Charles Totten is the one taking the lead in the United States, and it starts being picked up by a whole lot of Americans. It starts to become very racial. And the white supremacists who hear British, ide uh, British Israel ideas in the United States, they love what they hear, John. They, they right. just love it. It it gives the white supremacists a sort of a biblical rationale to prove that the Anglo-Saxon and the white race is somehow superior to other races. And, and if I haven't explicitly stated it yet, I, I know we have in last episodes, the core British Israel idea is that the ten, that the English-speaking peoples are the ten lost tribes of Israel. And so the, the white supremacists, this gives them a basis to say the Anglo-Saxons are the superior race and every other race is inferior. And, and so it really, it really appeals to the white supremacist community when they hear these ideas. Right. And it wasn't just, you know, the white supremacists. You have to understand the core of this doctrine that 
the ten lost tribes of Israel are, you know, the Anglo-Saxon race, basically. It was really a way to take the gospel of unity that's in the Bible, the, you know, the gospel is to the Jews and the Gentiles, and try to separate that into rank so that you had a superior uh, version of people, basically, and they were the lost ten tribes of Jews, which would rule over the others. So it wasn't that they were saying that the non-British um, Israel lineage would be doomed to hell. It was that they there was a superior people. And so maybe if we talk about the tenets of British Israelism a bit, the idea was that most Israelites that we see in the world today are not the Jews. And historically, they used pseudo-archaeology and quite honestly, just false archaeology and false history to try to build this notion religiously that the people that we're calling the Jews today aren't the Jews and that the actual descendants of the tribes of Israel were scattered to the four winds and emerged as, you know, England and Scandinavia, just, you know, various, various uh, countries and that the Jews that we see today aren't the Jews. And I mean, if you stop and think about it, think about what Hitler did. Hitler used this as literally a means to eradicate the Jews. So while it's not at its core a racist theology, if you follow out the doctrines to their conclusion, they have to end in racist theology. So it's literally laying the foundation that there is a superior people and they use the Bible to further this doctrine, but they ignore several scriptures. You know, the gospel is to the Jew and the Gentile. And um, that's why you see a lot of cults that spring up from this. They use this as a means to create an us versus them mentality. And they use certain passages from the Bible to favor the notion that their group or their sect is superior to all other Christians. And uh, I mean, honestly, it is it is the mold from which cults are developed. It is also why you see many of these religious cults that so strongly emphasize the Old Testament and the Old Covenant instead of understanding the New Covenant and the New Testament. Yeah, you know, as British Israelism gradually becomes more and more racial, that is where it ends up. It ends up in exactly what you described, John. It ends up in um, putting every other race, Jews included, into an inferior category. And when that happens, when it reaches the point that it has created this master race theology, at that point, that is when we start calling it Christian identity theology. Right. Um, and so this is where British Israelism is headed. Uh, but as you're in the 1870s and 1880s, it's not quite there yet. Uh, it's definitely being used by white supremacists in the United States to marginalize non-whites. But from the early days of British Israelism and really up into the 1920s and 30s, it's actually still very supportive of Israel, as far as the Jewish people, I should say. Um, and it, ha it it's not until it finally makes its full twist to Christian identity theology that it starts to turn on the Jews. And that's the last group that they turn against is the Jews, um, which is again happening, right, as everything's happening in Nazi Germany and, and so forth. But at, at this point in time, the late 1800s, it's primarily against non-whites uh, and non-Jews is, is mainly who they're... Tar targeting as the inferior races and they actually develop a very elaborate end time teaching system about reestablishing the Jewish nation in Israel in the land of Israel and that becomes a key part of their uh, their beliefs in, in the earlier in the middle days of the movement they more or less see themselves we are the 10 lost tribes and it's our duty to reestablish our Jewish brethren in yeah. the homeland <laughs> of Israel and rebuild the temple and all they they develop a you know an elaborate end time teaching around that before before Christian identity theology is fully emerged and becomes anti-semitic so it 
Br- British Israelism to Christian identity theology takes this really dramatic turn where they actually reject some of their original core ideas. And and the way they do that, John, is that as you come into the 1920s and Christian identity theology is really being born very strongly, um, they begin to say, wait a minute, no, the Jewish people are actually imposters and the true tribe of Judah is Germany. Ironic, huh? So that is actually, I, in my view, and I, I think most most literature I read, that is the key thing where they turn from British Israelism to Christian identity, is the moment when they say, wait a minute, the Jews are imposters, Germany is the real tribe of Judah. And that that's kind of, for me, is the, the dividing line where British Israelism turns into Christian identity theology when they make that, they, that, make that cut over. But back here in the 1800s, they haven't quite done that yet. Yeah, they're they're mainly targeting um, non-whites with their ideology, and that's what really appeals, especially to the white supremacists. Um, you know, we've just come out of the American Civil War, slavery has just been ended, and the world has been turned upside down in the Southern United States, and and the white supremacists come into this ideology right in those years, and it it forms a basis for them to continue to have a religious reasons to maintain stratified control over the non-white races in the United States. And at the same time, you had John Alexander Dowie, who was adding fuel to this fire. He was a strong proponent of this, and he believed that his Zion City, Illinois, was basically reestablishing the Davidic kingdom, and he was establishing himself as the chief of the Davidic kingdom. Um, there was a strong notion that they were going to... Dowie actually tried to buy Jerusalem outright. I don't know if you knew that or not. He, they were they had this big money drive where they thought that they could somehow magically purchase <laughs> Jerusalem. But it, to you and I, this sounds strange, and we think, well, that's a harebrained idea. But there were so many religious people in the United States, mainly in Pentecostalism, that had the same sort of notion because Dowie's influence in early fundamentalist religion and especially in Pentecostalism was such that they all started believing that they were somehow connected to this Davidic kingdom. Charles Fox Parham, who came and tried to basically seize control of Zion after Dowie died, he and John G. Lake and F.F. Bosworth created this sect where they all thought that they were going to reestablish this kingdom. Yeah, they were all British Israelites. They were all British Israelites. And what's interesting, if you study that history, it turned very, very destructive. They, they were literally torturing, beating, and killing people in different w- forms of exorcisms and, you know, trying to heal people until there there was this strange scenario where they all had to flee because they were all going to get arrested for murder. John G. Lake goes to into Africa, F.F. F. Bosworth hides in his revivals, and, you know, this thing turned into a mess. But the premise behind this mess was the British Israelism doctrine that Dowie had taught them combined with Dowie's healing doctrine all of this exploded into the post-World War II healing revival. So this is one of the fundamental elements of the post-World War II healing revivals. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right there, John. And let me, let's dive just into that just a little bit more um, as, to, as to how those, those things merge together. Because this all happened in the 1800s is really when all of these nonsense ideas <laughs> i'll just be straight all of these nonsense ideologies um, merge together to form this great you know n- massive crazy i mean this stuff's crazy john i mean <laughs> i crazy. feel crazy just talking about it you feel crazy talking about it. this stuff's crazy it's the result of shutting off critical thought when you i mean you and i look at this all of our listeners are listening to this thinking well how in the world did these i mean these are some of these are respected men how did they believe this nonsense and it's because they've shut off critical thought because the religious component allowed religious leaders to basically become destructive religious leaders and i think most movements that are descended from British Israelism today 
are embarrassed by their history, which yes. is why there are so few books. That's why there's so few <laughs> any investigation into all of this stuff. Because this is lunacy. This stuff is lunacy, John. I mean, this is lunacy, this stuff that they've done here. And they're all ashamed and embarrassed of it, all the people that was involved in this. And sad thing is the message is is in a lot of ways descended from this madness right here. Um William Branham's message would not exist without British Israelism. No, so a lot of the core, if you subtract the core British Israel idea that um, we're the ten lost tribes of Israel, every other significant belief of British Israelism found its way into the message and exists in an evolved form in the message to this day, John. British Israelism is more than just believing we're the ten lost tribes of Israel. There's a whole package of stuff that came with it. Even the Malachi for Elijah doctrine as a result of this. Dowie, yes. Dowie was a strong proponent of the British Israel doctrine, a strong supporter and promoter of it. And he believed that he was the messenger for the age, the return of Elijah. He used Malachi 4 as his basis. They believed that Malachi 4, instead of pointing to Jesus as the one who would restore the, you know, the failed law, the failed old covenant, as as explained in the New Testament, they believed that there was coming a person in our days, or actually in Dowie's last century, that they would be the restorer. So Dowie was known as Elijah the Restorer, and when he failed, other people tried to take the title. Charles Fox Parham was another Elijah. William Branham was another Elijah. And you can go, you can follow history and you can see every single cult that emerged with a quote-unquote Elijah personality resulted from this British Israel doctrine. You're right. And, you know, so as the British Israelism comes to the United States, as Charles Totten is spreading it and it's becoming popular among ministers in the United States, especially white supremacists, that is the point in time in the late 1800s that serpent seed I ideology gets introduced into British Israelism, John. Serpent Seed is in late 1800s um, British Israelism. Right. And um, let me explain how that happened, okay? So early British Israelism, you know, from the days of John Wilson and stuff, it already had this idea that there were what they called two seed lines. So they had a two seed line idea. And they believe that um, the Jewish people and the Ten Lost Tribes, the Anglo-Saxons, they were part of the good seed line. And everybody else was part of the bad seed line. Okay, And so they have these two seed line concepts. Now, in the origin of British Israelism, they did not have a explanation of where these two seed lines came from. They just believe there's two seed lines. Okay, But as you come into the 1890s in the United States... There comes a preacher who comes up with a theory of where these seed lines came from. And that preacher's name is Russell Kelso Carter. Russell Kelso Carter. And this is a person that probably every last single person in the message has been impacted from. Um, and, and there's probably lots of people who know him, actually. Um, so, you know, in the message, we used to sing the song, Standing on the Promises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's Russell one of Kelsey, his songs, huh? Yeah, Russell Kelsey Carter wrote that song. This wow. man is very, very prominent in British Israelism and a very prominent minister in our line of influence into the message, actually, John. I can't name a single church that I went to, and I went to churches you know, all throughout the United States. I can't think of one that did not sing that song. Yeah, he, he, he wrote a quite a fair number of songs that we sing into the message, into the present wow. day, for sure. Yeah, he's a, he's a very you know, influential figure into the message in more than one way, as we will find out. So he develops this idea um, of where these seed lines came from. And he wrote this book. I, I got a picture of it here. This is called The Tree of Knowledge. He wrote this in the 1890s. And this is... To the best of my knowledge, John, to, to the depth of all of my research, this is the point at which Serpent Seed entered into British Israelism, was this book. <clears throat> he had been influenced, he was basically converted into British Israelism by uh, Cal Totten. Um, 
And then he starts writing extensively on the topic, and he ends up counter-influencing Cal Totten with this book. But here, basically, let me just give you a few excerpts um, from, from this book. So he, in this book, you know, he, he tells on page 303 that Eve cohabitated with Satan or the serpent, and that's where Cain come from. And then he goes on to explain on page, um, here's page 382, that this produced an entire poisoned race. The poisoned race was produced by this union between them. And he goes on to explain that, um, <laughs> the black man is, you know, wow. he can't really help that he's black, you know, because of this. And that only a miracle can ever make him white, right? Like That's that. Awful. This is a direct quote. He is black and only a miracle can make him white. This is a quote from the book. So, you know, this thing is racial from day one. And here, here's the another thing in the book, John, too, because this is, this is going to be familiar to people who have been listening to things we've been talking about up to this point. On page 193, he explains how the pure race will eventually produce a generation of miniature Jesus Christs. Hmm. Okay? This stuff runs deep, John. Yeah, this that's stuff terrible. runs deep. And so so serpent seed was mixed with this idea of uh, you know, miniature Jesus Christs and racism from its inception and introduction into British Israelism. There, there's only one person I am aware of in the United States who taught Serpent Seed before Russell Kelso Carter. His name's Daniel Parker. He He's from Indiana, too, actually. He's from Vincennes, Indiana. He's the only person I'm aware of who taught British, who taught, rather, Serpent Seed before Russell Kelso Carter. It's possible Carter picked it up from him. I don't know. Um, it's not clear in the histories. Nobody really knows. Um, but his version was racist too. If you go look, his version was racist. It was also black people are descended from the serpent. That is, this thing has been every version of race of serpent seed in the 1800s was racist. It was always racist. It was never anything but racist. Okay, and this is the line in which it comes into uh, the message and William Branham. And so, yeah, that's an interesting facts, isn't it, John? It is. And if you really take a step back and think about it, I've I've been to this point talking about its significance to politics and its significance to world history. But just take a moment and think about the difference between what's in the Bible and what's in this doctrine. This is literally trying to suggest that the sin in the world exists because of an impure blood and that there are certain people who are superior to other people. That's why cults like this doctrine so much. It takes away the, the thought of sin being something that we can, clear, you know, we can try to overcome ourselves because it's in the blood. This is a bloodline doctrine. So people who are in this, that's why you see so many cults that sprung up from this doctrine who are so just um, dis not just discriminating but they're they they feel like they're better than the people who aren't in whatever movement they're in they are very condescending towards other people even people who are like us who are trying to explain the histories even just suggesting that there is some history that they don't know they will be very condescending against those people because they feel like they're better than those people right and let me point out russell kelso carter knew john alexander dowie he went to zion he preached to zion um he knew ab simpson he was he was connected to all of the preeminent british israel ministers of his day in, including john alexander dowie ff F. bosworth probably met him you know um there's he's it's all fully connected this thing is all fully connected um and so as he as he comes up with his serpent seed ideas in in this book the tree of knowledge in the 1890s cal totten back in yale university he loves it it's awesome it's great to him 
and he takes it and he puts it into the national literature, you know, the basic concepts of it feed into the national British Israel literature, and the serpent seed enters mainstream British Israelism all across the United States um, through, uh, through, through Charles Totten. Okay, so this is happening in the late 1800s, and as as that goes on, that's spreading. It's mixing with all of the white supremacists in the United States who just are loving and feeding on um, the ideas in British Israelism. Okay, so there's one other thing I want to mention too, John, about um, Russell Kelso Carter. So Russell Kelso Carter was a very very sick man, actually. He was chronically ill for almost his entire life. You know, he had terrible health problems almost his entire life. And that's actually part of what brought him into contact with John Alexander Dowie and Albert Simpson and all of these figures. He was hoping to get healed, you know. He was actually seeking his entire life, a lot of his life was spent seeking divine healing for his chronic illnesses. And he, you know, after having met them and learning a lot of their beliefs, he wrote this book. It's called... Uh, atonement the atonement for sin and sickness the atonement for sin and sickness and this is he is not the originator of the beliefs in this book but he is documenting in this book what he learned from john alexander dowie what he learned from albert simpson what he learned from the other british israelite healing ministers of his day and in this book john he is putting this is as far as i know the earliest documented versions of positive confession are in this book the just about the earliest documented um versions of um um dual atonement are in this book right and so through this we have very solid evidence that the healing ministers of john alexander dowie's era were definitely preaching positive confession dual atonement type ideas um, and these form the basis f uh, for what ff F. bosworth ends up believing and teaching um, in his books and coming straight on down to william branham this is quimbyism what quimbyism has turned into in british israelism so somewhere in the <clears throat> in the mid 1800s the british israelite ministers have imported ideas from quimbyism and we've mentioned him before phineas quimby the father of Quimbyism or New Thought, they they have imported his ideas and produced positive confession, and then they married it with dual atonement to make it Christian. All right, positive confession by itself is is New Thought. That is Quimbyism. But when they marry it with the dual atonement, which is what is happening there in that book by Russell Kelso Carter, they're they're giving it a, a Christian rationale on the back end and basically Christianizing New Thought ideas. Yeah. It was a cross-pollination before it entered into mainstream religion in the United States. It was a political pseudoscience doctrine. But then once this mixed with John Alexander Dowie and the healing ministry, this, again, it sets up the foundation for what would become the healing revival. It has taken this weird twist where it is now a, instead of off to the side as just a, interesting historical doctrine it now becomes a fun fundamental doctrine to the christian faith for all of its adherents and we're talking dowie and every mostly pentecostals who are influenced by dowie but it actually gets through through the healing revivals it gets into other churches you'll find especially in the south some of the southern baptist churches have the same exact theology um and not even realizing that this is a racist theology, they are born and raised into these churches that teach the pseudoscience and believe it, at never questioning it. So they emerge as new religious leaders who are still promoting the same doctrine, not understanding that it's in no way even historically accurate. Yeah, so it, it's something else. So when, when you can kind of, I hope I've painted somewhat of a picture so people get have some kind of an idea of what british israelism looks like at the turn of the century you know the turn in, coming into the 1900s british israelism is not just an idea that the 10 lost tribes of israel are are the anglo-saxons it is that but it's also pyramidology and it's also um the divine healing ideas that evolved out of quimbyism 
you know, positive confession, dual atonement. It's also um, serpent seed and these racial views. All of this and a whole lot more. It's also a whole set of end time teachings about the restoration of Israel. Um, so, and more. So, British Israelism is this big ball of ideas. And, you know, when I talk about British Israelism, I'm not just talking about... Um, the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. I, in my mind, I'm seeing this entire full-blown ideology that has been developed by these guys over the course of a century, right? Yeah. And so, and this British Israel ideology, it's accepted in different degrees in different places, right? So, like you take, um, you take different people, they accept it in different ways. For example, the Jehovah Witnesses took some of these ideas when they developed their teachings. Charles Russell, you take the Adventists, they took some of these ideas when they developed their teachings. You take different groups, Pentecostalism and the message, they take parts of these and it evolves over time. And we know, John, we know that a very large part of William Branham's inner circle was British Israelite. Gordon Lindsay was British Israelite. F.F. F. Bosworth was British Israelite. You know, on and on the circle around William Branham were British Israelites. And so did Gordon Lindsay and F.F. F. Bosworth and these guys believe serpent seed? You know, we don't know. We don't have any hard evidence that they ever publicly taught it or, or, or confessed it. But they were certainly in the line of people, okay? They were certainly around. I mean, they all knew this guy. They all knew Russell Kelso Carter. They were in the... They were members of the Anglo-Saxon World Federation, um, and these topics like serpent seed were topics that were taught in their conferences. So it's we don't know for sure whether they accepted these ideas entirely or not, but William Branham was certainly around people who had been completely exposed to this ideology. Yeah. Again, it's much bigger of a topic than we can fully describe in one episode, but I'm trying to think of the best way to explain it where listeners get it. And I think probably the easiest way is it's like the salt and pepper shaker that enhances the flavor of the food. So if you have a group that has a doctrine that Malachi 4 is pointing to me, the central figure, as we have seen in many cults. You sprinkle the British Israelism doctrine on it, and now you can take Malachi and point it to yourself. Take somebody who is claiming that a certain period of time is leading up to the blood moons and and the... You know, I, I had one group who contacted me and said that they were looking at the red heifer that just was born in Israel. And this is part of the end of days scenario. Well, that's because they've taken British Israelism and they've sprinkled it onto this red heifer that was that was uh, apparently born in Israel a few years ago. You can take literally you can take any old covenant doctrine that was under the old covenant law that was fully replaced by the new covenant of you know Jesus Christ who entered us into the new covenant read the book of hebrews ministers who want to use the manip- the manipulation of different rules and regulations for whatever sect that they want if you take the british israelism as a doctrine and sprinkle it on whatever is your theology now you can point this theology to your day through british israelism so it's it's not like there's one british israel theology that emerged in all the churches it's that it was used as the flavoring for many 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 doctrines into the churches I think that's a really good way to put it because it never formed its own denomination. It never formed its own unified group, you know, in that way. It is, it's, that's a great way to put it. It's, it's a spice or a flavor that is added into other movements. That, that's really a good way to put it. And I, I want to point out too that William Branham preached serpent seed um, identically. I mean, he he could have been reading out of Russell Kelso Carter's book when he preached his sermon. He wasn't. I do know the book he did have, (laughs) (laughs) because I have all the books in his library. We'll get to that one. But he could have been reading out of Russell Kelso Carter's book, because it's the same same concept, John. Um, And let me, I'm just going to give one quote. Remember, Russell Kelso Carter in his book said that uh, Satan 
cohabitated with Eve, and Cain was born, Cain, the son of Satan. Here's what William Branham said. And i got to read this quote, because in my part of the message, they told us William Branham never said this stuff. But he did, John. He did. Um, this is from the 1958 sermon, The Serpent Seed. William Branham said, what did he do? He began making love to Eve, and he lived with her as a husband, and saw it was pleasant. So she went and told her husband, but she was already pregnant by Satan. And she brought forth her first son, who was Cain, the son of Satan. William Branham taught that Eve had relations with the Satan, who was possessing the serpent, right, more or less. And this is where Cain came from. And, and then... We'll do this in our next episode. We'll tra we'll show exactly who William Branham said the serpent seed's descendants are. And William Branham traces this right down to Africans and Jews, is what he does in this exact same sermon. He traces the line of Cain's descendants directly to the Jews and Africans in this sermon. Yeah. And so William Branham was teaching, you know, exactly the same thing that Russell Kelso Carter taught, exactly what British Israelism and Christian identity taught on this subject, that Cain was the son of Satan, and that this ultimately produces Africans, and it finds its way to corrupt the Jewish race. And there's, there's one other thing, too, John, I want to point out here as well from these books, is who did Cain marry? And, and you'll see why this is important. Who was Cain's wife? So British Israelism had a belief about this too, John. Really? So, yes. Uh, okay, you, you're going to connect some dots here. So, <laughs> British Israelism believed that on the same day that God created the beasts of the field, he created these mongrel peoples, mongrel races of peoples that don't have souls, basically soulless mongrel peoples. And they believe that after, and you'll find this, if you want to read through Michael Barcoon's book, these books I've recommended spell all this out, okay? And I, again, we have it in the primary materials. They believe that <clears throat> these mongrel peoples, um, when Cain grew up after he murders Abel, Cain marries one of these mongrel, not soulless people, right? And this is who his wife is, right? And then they get married and then produce all of their children, right? Okay, this is where British Israelism and Christian identity theology places that stuff, okay? Now, do you remember what George D. Ark was preaching at Roy Davis's church? <laughs> exactly. That is what Roy Davis was preaching at Roy... George D. Ark was preaching at Roy Davis's church. William Branham told us that himself. And... Um, let me, let me read his quote. This is from Questions and Answers on Hebrews 1957. William Branham says, Now it's been said, and I hope my colored friends that's in here will excuse this remark because it's absolutely not right. The first time I ever met anyone in my life after I had been converted, I was met brother George D. Ark and them down there. George D. Ark was assistant pastor at... Uh, Roy Davis's church, the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And I was walked, and the Lord led me to that little place, and they was discussing where the colored man came from. And they were trying to say that the colored man, dot, 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 he leaves out. What he does there is he leaves out the initial serpent seed concept, and he jumps straight to Cain. Cain married an animal like an ape, and through there come forth the colored race. You know, And then he goes on to say all that's wrong. William Branham, by his own admission, admits that this ideology was being taught in Roy Davis's church, the white supremacist church founded by the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, it, it's all fully connected. It's all right there, black and white. Yeah. And keep in mind, the serpent seed doctrine had been fully cleansed of all the racism because of the point in time in which it's delivered. The country's divided, and he wants to appeal to both sides. But then he later introduces the hybriding doctrine. And let me just read a quote from the hybriding doctrine. He says, The Smyrnian church had drifted far from the original. It had become a hybrid hybriding doctrine. It hybridized itself in the way that Eve did. You know that a hybrid is what comes of two species mixing. The result is no longer pure like the original. It is a mongrel. So William Branham 
you know, he's often talking about, <laughs> it's like the Lord of the Rings. He's, he refers to these, some people as the orcs. So these are the orcs. These are the people with no souls. And if you really take a step back and look at it from the lens of the Bible, what he's really saying is that there are these people without souls that are from this impure race. And if you follow that to its conclusion, those people cannot and will not ever be saved, even if you show them the gospel. So one last quote, William Branham talks about the gospel. He says, the gospel is not even to the Jews. I'll put the quote up on the screen, but he is literally saying that he is taking the British Israel side of even the gospel. You can't even present the gospel to the Jews because again, they're this mongrel race. They're they're the the bad guys in the Lord of the Rings scenario that William Branham is creating. Yeah, you know, when it, when it comes to the Jewish people, there's this weird the message does this really weird thing where on one hand, we love the Jews, and then on the other hand, we don't love the Jews. Yeah. <laughs> it it's so on one hand, we're very supportive, but on the other hand, don't you ever share the gospel? I mean, where I come from, you would they made fun and put down anybody who would make any sort of evangelization effort towards Jewish people, you know. There was a and William Branham, I mean, how many times does he say the word hook nose Jew, right? Exactly. I mean, and and we believed uh, I don't even know that we're going to have time to get into all of this in this episode, John. But, I mean, we were there were very strong racial views concerning the Jews as well in the message. Yeah. Um, but what what we have through these quotes and everything is we have just insurmountable evidence that William Branham was exposed to these teachings from, you know, the earliest days of his ministry, for sure. And... and the thing is, John, and this is what gets me, John. This this uh, burns me more than anything else. William Branham told us he learned serpent seed and got it as a divine revelation from God. He told us it was one of the la one of the great mysteries that was specially revealed just to the end time bride and the message, right? But here we have read people. And there's there's lots more, lots of people preaching this before William Branham was even born in a manner nearly identical to what William Branham taught. And you could even go so far as to say, William, I have, so he preached the sermon in 1958, John. So I have the 1957 book on my shelf. I think it's right here where my finger is. It's called Cain, Son of the Serpent. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's the 1957 book. William Brand preached this in 1958. He had that book in his library. I mean, he is reading out of these books when he preached this stuff. And yeah. it this 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 is what gets me so much is that he told us he got all this stuff from God. Let me read a quote of him saying he got this in divine revelation from God. And this is like a double punch in the gut, John. It's bad enough to find out that this thing is racist. Not only is it racist, this was the, even the bigger punch for me, was finding out he didn't get it from God. He didn't get it from God, right? And so if you want to throw away all the racist stuff and not care, about, uh, if you're in the message and you want to ignore the racist stuff, that's fine. But you got to confess, William Branham copied this stuff from other people. You can't get around that. So maybe we could say he was only patronizingly racist, but he was definitely deceiving us about where he got this revelation from. Let me read quote. He says, this is from, it is the rising of the sun. He says, the seven mysteries, sevenfold mystery of the Bible that's been closed up since the foundation of the world will be revealed. And we, yet a humble little group compared with all the world, we've enjoyed the blessings in hearing those mysteries, marriage, divorce, serpent seed, all of these different questions that's been completely revealed to us, not by man, but by God himself that's opened the seven mysteries of what the church was and how it was in Christ at the beginning and how it would be revealed in the last day. You know, William Branham told us this was part of this divine stuff he got from God for the last days when the truth is he is just repeating teachings that he had heard all the way back from the earliest days of his ministry. Yeah, I think for me, Charles, the 
part that really bothers me the most. You know this by well enough now by knowing me, but I'm a people person. I like all people. I don't care if you hate my guts. I'm still going to try to get you to like me. That's just my nature. I'm a people person. And this is the way it's supposed to be. Humans are supposed to like other humans. They're supposed to love other humans. If my son were to turn against me and disown me, try to leave me, I'm going to do everything within my power to try to make him love me again. I don't care what he does. He, my son could go murder somebody and be put in prison. I'm still going to try to show him the same love and I'm going to love him no matter what. That's the way, as a father, that's the way it is. That's the way Jesus is in the Bible. And that's the way he instructs Christians to be, to love your neighbor, to love your brother. Well, this doctrine, this British Israelism doctrine, created the framework to be condescending towards people who disagreed with you. If you don't believe our theology that we've sprinkled Brit British Israelism on, then you're of the serpent seed. You're of the bad race. And I can be condescending. Be Pre yeah. So uh, that's why we see William Branham using terms like cannon fodder to people who don't agree with him. He sprinkled British Israelism on his doctrine. Now he can be condescending to them because they're of the bad seed. So no matter how you take this, although in its inception it was not racist, it was the foundation required to bring religion and racism and merge them together and become this hybrid of evil. And that's literally, that's what we end up with here. But there's, <clears throat> there's just so much more than we can cover in this show today. I'm looking really, I'm looking really forward to getting into the uh, serpent seed doctrine because that's where we're going to start seeing Roy Davis come back into the picture. And that, that whole history just fascinates me. So, Charles, why don't we wrap it up here, and next week let's dive a little bit deeper with the serpent seed, Christian identity, racism doctrines. Sounds good, John. I'm, I'm excited, looking forward to the next, next episode. And maybe one last note, British Israelism and this idea is not strictly Pentecostal. It's in lots of it, it was in lots of other groups, and there are still British Israel groups out there today. Um, the Branch Davidians, Waco, Texas, they were British Israelites. Uh, Herbert Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God, they're British Israelite. So there there are other groups outside of Pentecostalism. This is not strictly a, a Pentecostal ideology, and I I look forward to uh, deep diving more into Serpent Seed and into. Um, Christian identity theology more in our next episode, John. How it got into the latter rain, how it spread into the message, how it exists in groups to the present day. Absolutely. So if you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org and christiangospelchurch.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the Healing Revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Join us again next week. We've got a great episode coming.